Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One key theme that you'll see being brought up over and over again within Lev Shestov's early work, All Things Are Possible, is the connection between what he calls positivism, and we'll talk about what that means in this case in just a minute, and the broader field of metaphysics, which would include not just the field itself, but particular theories in it, and usually positivism has understood itself and been understood by those interpreting it as being anti-metaphysical. Shestov wants to suggest to us that things are not quite so simple as it seems. And first we need to get clear about, well, what is positivism? In part because if you had an introduction to philosophy class or you've been looking around in the history of philosophy, there is a tendency to confound positivism in the broad sense with a particular movement in philosophy in the 20th century called logical positivism, which is arising and becoming prominent after Shestov has published this. So he's not targeting A.J. Ayer or the early Wittgenstein or the Vienna Circle. He's targeting something that's a broader social and political and intellectual movement that goes back quite a bit further. Indeed, so far back that he identifies uh, a particular thinker, Voltaire, as having some positivist aspects, even though it's before the term is coined. And we typically associate it with Comte. And so we're talking about, you know, mid 19th century onward. And so what is positivism? In, in short, you can say that it's a philosophical approach that says that we should focus on the positive, not positive thinking as in always look on the bright side or anything like that, but rather what we can actually know and build out from that. We should leave theology, we should leave metaphysics behind and focus on what we can have genuine knowledge of. So what does that translate into? Here's where a remark of Shestov, a very short one, uh, number 74 in the first part, he says, philosophy has always loved to occupy the position of a servant. In the Middle Ages, <clears throat> she was the handmaid of theology. Nowadays, she waits on science, and he notes a kind of inconsistency here that will characterize positivism of his time, but also later forms of it. At the same time, she calls herself the science of sciences. And so, you know, this is a great remark, right? It notes that philosophy quite often uh, sets itself above all the others, but at the same time wants to be subservient. And if we're leaving behind theology, we're leaving behind something else, what can take its place as the master or set of masters? Well, some notion of positive science. It could be the natural sciences plus mathematics, plus, as Comte said, sociology and psychology, right? It can be whatever it is that you want. And you see this tendency over and over and over again, arising even in our time. Now, 
Shestov thinks that positivism, which sort of frames itself as like the most up-to-date approach in philosophy, it's leaving behind all of this nonsense and silliness of metaphysics, let alone you know, God talk and theology. He's pointing out that, well, actually it's kind of connected to metaphysics. But before we get into that, let's talk about positivism and we could say human desires and needs. So the first remark that we want to look at is in chapter nine. He tells us, we know nothing of the ultimate realities of our existence, nor shall we ever know anything, let that be agreed. But because of this, it doesn't follow we must accept some or other dogmatic theory as a modus vivendi, as a way of living. This uh, inability of us to get to the ultimate you know, reality, uh, to get to a fully satisfying answer, doesn't mean that we have to jump into some sort of ism. And he notes, no, not even positivism, which has such a skeptical face on it. It's not really skeptical though. It's in, in reality, very devoted to a kind of dogma or set of dogmas of its own. And so he goes on and says, it only follows that man is free to change his conception of the universe as often as he changes his boots or his gloves. And that constancy of principle belongs only to one's relationships with other people so that they may know where and to what extent they may depend on us. On principle, man should respect order in the external world, complete chaos in the inner. And for those who find it difficult to bear such a duality, some internal order might be provided. Only they should not pride themselves on it, but always remember it's a sign of their weakness, pettiness, dullness. So he's rejecting positivism just as much as he's rejecting traditional metaphysics that positivism places itself as a contender against. If we go on to chapter uh, 98, there's an even more pessimistic uh, point of view that's, that's expressed here. He says that in order to merely to preserve our existence, we have to strain mind and body to the utmost. He goes on, he says, there's no time to think about truth. This is why positivism was invented with its theory of natural development. Now, what is this theory of natural development that he's talking about? You know, it takes place through history with human beings originally focusing on the gods. And that was actually, you know, made up stuff that they were projecting out there. And then they got away from the gods and theology into a metaphysical point of view that was driven by philosophy, right? But even that needs to be left behind. And now we can move on to the sciences and really get to the bottom of things. And uh, Shestov is suggesting here that he says, everything we see is mysterious and incomprehensible. Right? Philosophy is ever pushed aside to make room for the daily needs. So how does the pursuit of science really work itself out? Is it going to yield us truths, absolute truths? Probably not. He's rather pessimistic about it. And then he has something very interesting to say about his own times. And I think this is something that we can see repeated over and over again from generation to generation. So he says, in recent years, this is in, in uh, section 35 of, of part two, we see more and more change in the philosophies of writers and even non-literary people. The old men are beside themselves. Such shiftiness seems indecent. Con convictions are not gloves. Uh, but the young carelessly pass from one idea to another. And so he, he goes on and says that, you know, people go from ism to ism and they seem to abandon, you know, whatever it was they were committed to six months ago. And he says that um, the readiness to leave off one set of convictions in order to assume another shows complete indifference to convictions altogether. And he says to, um, you know, a lot of people, this seems really bad. But to all, those of us who fought long against all kinds of constancy, the levity of the young is a pleasant sight. Now notice what he says next. They will don materialism, positivism, conscientism, 
spiritualism, and so on, one after the other, till they realize that all theories, ideals, and ideas are as of little consequence as the hoop skirts and crinolines of our grandmothers, they will begin to live without ideals and prearranged purposes, without foresight, relying on chance and their own ready wit. This way, too, must be tried. Perhaps we shall do better by it. Anyhow, it will be more fun. Shostov is noting that this is always a possibility for us. We can always jump from ism to ism to ism. We are free as human beings to decide what convictions we are going to follow. And it seems that in his time, at least in his place where he's observing, younger people are doing this and older people are getting quite upset about it, right? So positivism, instead of becoming the end of philosophical development, becomes one more possibility, one more stage, if we want to use the positivist's own schema for understanding history. Now, we should talk about the connection that positivism actually does bear to metaphysics. He's got this brilliant remark here with a wonderful artistic metaphor in chapter 13 of part one. He says, on the whole, there's little to choose between metaphysics and positivism. In each, there is the same horizon, but the composition and coloring are different. Now, is, does positivism come out on top in this way? No. Why? Positivism chooses gray, colorless paint and ordinary composition. Metaphysics prefers brilliant coloring and complicated design and always carries the vision away into the infinite in which trick it often succeeds owing to its skill in perspective. Now, you could say, well, the good thing about positivism is that it's much more realistic. It's not leading us off into these horizons that we can't get into. Much like, you know, when you watch cartoons, very famously, The Roadrunner and Wild E. Coyote, uh, you know, a, a tunnel will be painted and it's a painted tunnel, right? You can't actually enter it. But the roadrunner does. And then the coyote tries to run after him and boom, he hits the wall because it's just a painted tunnel. He said, well, we shouldn't live in this world of fancies. If things happen, happen to be gray instead of, you know, multicolored, well, that's reality. Now, notice what Shestov says next. He says, the canvas is impervious. There's melt, no melting through into the other world. Nevertheless, skillful perspectives are very alluring so that metaphysicians will still have something to quarrel about with the positivist. Neither the positivists nor the metaphysicians actually get to the canvas itself. Neither of them are providing us with what we actually want. The metaphysicians seem to be doing so, but you know, to use the metaphor of the roadrunner, they are more wily e. coyote than anything else. He talks, as I mentioned before, about Voltaire's positivism uh, very briefly, and this is in uh, chapter uh, 41 of that, he says that, this is in a chapter called Metaphysical Consolations, right? Says that the, the more that you pierce to the ultimate ends of the infinite metaphysical problems, the more finite they reveal themselves. Metaphysicians only look out for some new boon. I nearly said pleasure. Voltaire said, if there was no God, he should be invented we explain these words by the great Frenchman's extreme positivism. Now, we should pause on that for a moment. What about positivism would tell you that Voltaire thinking that uh, if there is no God, he should be invented, you know, is, is an example of this. Well, Comte's own positivism took religion and tried to bring it up to date, tried to have a church of humanity, right? So positivism often has metaphysical and even religious aspirations. But then he goes on and says, the form only is positive. The content is purely metaphysical. All that a met metaphysician wants to do is convince himself that God exists, right? So Voltaire, seemingly a positivist, is just as much a metaphysician as 
as the people that he wants to criticize, right? And then finally, in uh, chapter 4 of part 2, we get this very interesting discussion about what, what is it that metaphysicians are doing and why they should be called, as he says, the positivists par excellence, showing us a thread that connects the two of them together. What is it? He says, metaphysicians praise the transcendental and carefully avoid it. Nietzsche, on the other hand, hated metaphysics and always lived in the realm of the transcendental. And he says, of course, the metaphysicians behave better. This is indisputable. And then he says, in these anxious days when positivism seems to fall short, one cannot do better than to turn to metaphysics. So, you know, with the assistance of a few books, the whole mysterious universe is conquered. Metaphysics, he says, is the great art of swerving round dangerous experience. And this is why they should be called the positivists par excellence. Because what are the positivists doing? You know, we're not going to deal with this. This is too, you know, uh, vague. Uh, this, this is stemming from some irrational origin. We're only going to focus on what's right in front of us. So he says, um, they do not despise all experience, but only the dangerous experiences. Nietzsche, on the other hand, is somebody who didn't avoid dangerous experiences, right? And so he says that in order to love the transcendental, it should be known only from the stage or from the books of the philosophers at, at a nice distance, right? This is called idealism, the nicest word ever invented by philosophizing men. So again, Shestov is drawing this connection between metaphysics and positivism and saying they're not really that far apart, uh, then we get this really interesting, long discussion in chapter 17 of, of part two, which begins by talking about Kant. Now, in our time, Kant is probably less important. Maybe he's important for moral theory, but there's not an awful lot of Kantians out there, I would say, in epistemology and metaphysics. But in Shestov's time, the effects of Kant and his critique of, of pure reason and his uh, uh, analysis of metaphysics um, was pretty, you know, of the present. So he says, ever since Kant succeeded in convincing the learned that the world of phenomena is quite other than the world of true reality, and that even our own existence is not our real existence, but only the visible manifestations of a mysterious unknown substance, philosophy has been stuck in a new rut and cannot move a single millimeter out of the track laid by the great Königsbergian. Backward or forward it can go, but necessarily in the Kantian rut. Kant has established a new paradigm, we might say. Is it a good paradigm? Is it a satisfying paradigm? He says, no, it, it definitely isn't. Surely the, uh, the contraposition between the world of phenomena and the thing as itself, he says, is an invention of the reasoning mind, as is the theory of knowledge, their akentness lera, to use the term that was circulating around, um, deduced from this contraposing. So the freedom-loving spirit could maybe reject this, right? And so we're going to talk about metaphysics and absurdity. He says that if you grant reason one single assumption, then uh, it is going to place you in its toils, right? In, in the, the, the trap or net. And he says, metaphysics cannot exist side by side with reason. Everything metaphysical is absurd. Everything reasonable is positive. So sometimes when we think we're doing metaphysics, looking at systems of metaphysics, it's really positivism of a different sort that we're engaged with. So he goes on and he says, the fundamental principle of metaphysics is absurdity, and yet surely many positive assertions can lay legitimate claim to that self-same highly respective predicate. Is there a means of distinguishing a metaphysical absurdity from a perfectly ordinary one? And he says, uh, 
No, all services rendered by reason must be paid for sooner or later at the exorbitant price of self-renunciation, renouncing your own freedom to think about things, to take stances on things. And so he tells us that sooner or later you are driven into, as he calls it, the streets of positivism. And he says, this happens all the time with young, inexperienced minds. What do they do first? They break the bridle and dash forward into space. They're doing some sort of, you know, uh, study, some sort of metaphysics. They're feeling their freedom. They're like, this is amazing stuff. And then what happens? Turns out that the originality that they feel themselves uh, pursuing, inhabited by, isn't really that original. Uh, Shestov says, um, they find themselves rushing into the same old Rome, whither, as we know, all roads lead, or to use more lofty language, rushing into the stable, whither all roads leave. And then he says, this is basically a type of positivism. But then he suggests to us a way to avoid this. Now, it's based on an assumption, which he's perfectly happy to say, not everybody will buy into so he says, the only way to guard against positivism, granting, of course, that positivism no longer attracts your sympathies. So if positivism still does attract your sympathies, this is not going to be helpful or effective for you. But if you've gotten sick of positivism, in part maybe because you realized the close affinity it has with the very metaphysics it claims to reject, well, then you have another option. What is it? To cease to fear any absurdities, whether rational, positive, or metaphysical, and systematically to reject all the services of reason. He says, such behavior has been known in philosophy, and I make bold to recommend it. Credo quia absurdum comes from the Middle Ages. This is the uh, famous statement often attributed as like his summary to Tertullian. Obviously, Tertullian wrote a lot more than just simply that line, but it, you know, it is a, a viewpoint, right? I believe because it is absurd. And he says, where can we find modern examples of this? And he brings up somebody who we talked about already, Friedrich Nietzsche. And then he talks about Arthur Schopenhauer. What do they do? Both present noble examples of indifference to logic and common sense. And then he says, especially Schopenhauer, look at him as a model. He is a Kantian who, even in the name of Kant, made such daring sallies against reason, driving her into confusion and shame. That astounding Kantian even went so far in the master's name still as to attempt the overthrow of space and time notions. Right? He talks about clairvoyance. He talks about music, uh, the primacy of will over reason. Right? And so he goes on quite a bit about Schopenhauer here. And you know, he's, he's going to close in part by talking about something that's available to us in his time and in ours. He tells us there will come a time when this unshakable foundation of positivism will be shaken. All gnosiological disputes as to what thought can or cannot achieve will seem to our posterity just as amusing as the disputes of schoolmen seem to us. We don't have to be bound by this contrast, either metaphysics or positivism. We can Go beyond both of them if we so choose, if that's our desire. There's no promise that it will automatically bear fruit for us or that people will like us as a result or will become the next, next great philosopher or anything like that. But it is possible to go beyond metaphysics and positivism, according to Shestov.